All right, we are back from break. So, um, how was special relativity so far? Um, there are, um, I'm guessing, some uh, real surprises that uh, space and time behave this way. We think of space and time as being so reliable, um, especially time. Uh, there's always this feeling that uh, every location should have time progressing at the same rate. Time is something that everybody can count on passing at the same rate, and turns out it's not true. Turns out that there are timing differences, and we have to be careful when we're determining how much time has passed in a particular reference frame. So, moving on, um, let's take a look at special relativity's uh, prediction, or what the formulas are, that we have to use now in order to add velocities. Now, this is an interesting uh, sort of problem, I guess. The idea is, here is Earth, and we have spacecraft number one uh, traveling at point six zero C with respect to the Earth. So, planet, spacecraft, uh, and uh, we've got a relative speed of point six zero C. Now, there's a second rocket launched from the first one, and this one is launched in a way where this rocket maintains its speed, I guess, and then this one is, it takes off on its own uh, such that it's moving at point six C with respect to rocket number one. So, how fast is rocket two moving relative to the Earth? And you're thinking, I don't even need a calculator for this one, right? Uh, I can just add those two velocities together. That should give me the answer. And it, it doesn't work. And, and you can see why it doesn't work. What would happen then is that uh, 0.6c plus 0.6c, that would add up to 1.2c. And we know that in the reference frame of the Earth, nothing could ever be measured to be traveling faster than c. Space and time are structured in a way where we'll never measure something traveling faster than c. It's just a property of space and time. So there's got to be some other way that we add velocities together here. So let's see what uh, the formulas from special relativity tell us. So the idea here then with velocity addition is to line up uh, the three different reference systems. If you're doing a velocity addition problem, there are going to be three different reference systems. There's going to be two of those relative velocities given, and then you'll be asked to solve for the third one. So the relative velocities here would be between the Earth and the rocket, uh, rocket B and rocket C, and then Earth A and rocket C. So I've listed these as relative velocity VAB, relative velocity VBC, and relative velocity VAC. Now, all of these three quantities would have to be less than the speed of light. They can't be greater than C. Now, we were told two of those. Uh, the three relative, oh, here's my drawing, too, of the Earth and the spacecraft. It's the Enterprise. And then the shuttlecraft. Anyway, um, <clears throat> VAB and VBC uh, are given as 0.60C. Now, to do the calculation in special relativity, what we do is we start off going, yeah, I know how to solve this problem. You just add them together. But special relativity shows us that there's actually a denominator built into this formula. It's not as simple as adding the two formulas together. I do get to add them together, but then I have to divide through by 1 plus VAB over C, VBC over C. Okay. That's just the formula. If you, we'll, we'll see uh, in a couple lectures what more of the mathematical foundation looks like for this. You can see where all these formulas are coming from. Uh, and we'll get a chance to derive a few of these formulas. But uh, that formula, it, it, it comes from some very foundational uh, formulas in, in special relativity that have to do with 
the way space and time are constructed. So um, if I plug into my formula that uh, I've been told I should go ahead and do, I plug all those numbers in, I find out that relative velocity VAC is equal to 0 0.882 times C. Yeah, it comes in less than C. And you can try this out. I mean, you can try out your own set of numbers. What if we put in 0 0.9 and 0 0.9? Well, the numerator is 1.8 but the denominator becomes 1.81c. Anyway, it, it, um, it, it works, and it works in a way where none of the relative velocities are ever going to be greater than c. If you get something greater than c, you've got to stop and look and, and check your, your problem. Um, what do these mean? Now that we've calculated numbers, what do they even mean? And what they mean is this. If I'm on Earth measuring the speed of rocket B, I am going to measure that as VAB, and I'm going to measure it at 0.60C. If I'm in rocket B, measuring the speed of Earth moving away from me, I'm going to measure that at 0.6. So this is kind of interesting. If I'm in rocket B, and I work within my own reference frame, what rocket B sees is Earth moving away from it in one direction at point, ooh, this direction, at point 0.6C, and it sees the, the other rocket ship moving away from it at point 0.6C. So within the frame of B, um, there is no object moving faster than the speed of light. But what it does see, what uh, uh, you know, an observer in uh, Rocket B would see is that Rocket C and Earth are separating from each other at a speed of 1.2 C. So, within one reference frame, you can have something traveling the speed of light in one direction, and you can have something traveling at speed of light in the other direction, and the relative speed between them would be double the speed of light. That's the highest relative velocity you'll measure within one frame. Uh, but when we actually go in and ask, okay, now there's an observer on A measuring how fast the rocket's moving away. How fast is the rocket moving away? And in Earth's frame, rocket C is only moving away at 0.882. So in Earth's frame, they see rocket B moving away at 0.6, and rocket C moving away at 0.882, within Earth's reference frame, there is only a separation speed between the two rockets of 0.282. Okay. So with this, you know, you go into each one of the reference frames and you ask what's going on. If I'm in rocket C, I'm, in, I'm, I'm at rest within that reference frame, then I see rocket B uh, moving away from me at 0.6, and I see Earth moving away from me at 0.882. Okay, and that's how you work back and forth between the three different relative speeds that we've calculated. Okay. All right, questions on that, let me know. Uh, another interesting uh, feature of... Uh, special relativity. All right, as much fun as the uh, space and time calculations are, uh, there's something that we're going to need that's much more important. In fact, I'm going to say for the rest of the course, the space and time calculations, they're going to come up intermittently from time to time. Uh, these energy and momentum part of the problem, these are going to show up in every chapter. Okay, so we're going to keep coming back to these energy, uh, kinetic energy, momentum formulas from special relativity because they look quite a bit different from the formulas that we learned back in Physics 4A. And they are. The formulas are different. So the fundamental formulas for energy and mass and momentum in special relativity are, first of all, E squared is equal to MC squared squared plus PC squared. 
where m is the mass of an object, p is the momentum of an object, and e is something new. It's something we haven't encountered yet. It, e does stand for energy, but it's what we call total energy. Now, total energy is a combination of mass and kinetic energy. So, we're used to, in physics 4A, we're used to thinking of mass as being one thing and kinetic energy as being something else. But now, in special relativity, we're going to combine those together. We're going to take the mass of an object, add on to that its kinetic energy that it might have, and that's going to give us something called total energy. And that becomes the fundamental quantity in special relativity. Now, notice from this second formula, you may have noticed this already, when an object's at rest, its total energy equals mc squared. So when we say, hey, E equals mc squared, we're really only talking about an object at rest. So when an object's at rest, its total energy is given by its mass. Now, what does that even mean to say that an object at rest has energy because of its mass? And uh, back in Physics 4a, we talked about energy conservation and momentum conservation. Now, energy conservation uh, in special relativity uh, involves big E. It's not that the kinetic energy is conserved, it's that this total effect is conserved. When we run a reaction in which the mass of an object changes, special relativity says some of that mass now can be switched over into kinetic energy. So we run reactions like these. If we run a matter-antimatter reaction, if we take an electron and an anti-electron and react those, uh, the electron and the anti-electron generate two high-energy photons. Well, the electrons have mass, the photons don't have mass. So, the mass of the electrons was not conserved in the reaction, but what did happen to the mass in the electrons is it was converted to kinetic energy. When we run a reaction like that, we find that total energy in the reaction is the same after as it was before. So the total energies are going to be the same before and after, even though in many reactions masses and kinetic energy are different before and after. So this new idea of total energy, that's going to be important. That's actually what gets conserved when we talk about energy conservation. Now, you guys know that we've done all kinds of physics, physics 4a, physics 4b, we've gotten through a ton of physics without ever having to worry about this, but, you know, in the upcoming chapters we are going to see examples of where reactions run and the particles coming out of the reaction are not the same ones that went in and they don't have the same mass. The masses are going to change and whenever mass changes, that means we have to watch for kinetic energy. Now, we can flip this around. What we can do is we can take low mass particles and run them together at very high energies, and we can take the kinetic energy of those particles and turn that into mass. And this is how in particle accelerators, we are able to generate objects and generate particles that have much higher masses. We use kinetic energy being converted into mass in those reactions. So kinetic energy and mass can be converted back and forth. Now these two fundamental equations from special relativity end up creating two categories of fundamental particles. It turns out that there is a category where m is equal to zero. There's nothing in these formulas that tells us that m cannot be zero. Now classical physics kind of suggests that if something exists it should have mass, 
But special relativity says no, mass is not a requirement. Uh, these formulas work just fine if we set n equal to zero. Now, right now, the objects we know of that have no mass are photons. Light doesn't have any mass. The individual particles that make up light, to the best of our measurements, have no mass. Now, it could be, in the future, uh, we find out that photons do have mass. If they do have mass, it's really tiny, because we've really done careful measurements of this. But it, it could be that photons also have mass. And in that case, if they have mass, they're not traveling at the speed of light. Or they're not traveling at C. Let's say that. So it turns out some of the predictions from uh, special relativity are for particles that have no mass, looking at these equations here, the energy and the momentum have this very simple relationship. Energy is equal to P times C. P times C is equal to energy. So energy and momentum are the same thing. We actually used this back in Physics 4B in chapter 32 when we were talking about electromagnetic waves uh, about how much energy and how much momentum, if you remember, uh, were in light. So light contains both energy and momentum and that says that um, light can exert a force. If light is absorbed by an object, that object acquires the momentum that those photons had. All right, so another example of conservation laws. Um, so E is equal to PC. Now, for a photon, all of its energy is kinetic because none of its energy is mass. Now, for everything else, where mass is not equal to zero, uh, it turns out we can use these formulas. I haven't gone through and, and carefully shown the derivations, but we will. We'll come back and, and show where these are coming from. Uh, total energy of an object can be written as gamma times mc squared. So if an object is moving, uh, we can calculate its gamma factor and determine what the total energy will be. Uh, to get kinetic energy, what I do is I take the total energy and subtract off the mass. So kinetic energy then is gamma minus 1 times mc squared. If I'm at rest, gamma is going to be equal to 1. And so for an object at rest, E is equal to mc squared, and there is no kinetic energy. Now, for a massless object, it can't be at rest. A massless particle, like the photon, is traveling at C at all times. Can't speed up, can't slow down. Um, you remember from optics, we talked about indexes of refraction and said that the passage of light uh, did slow down, passing through materials, but that's not a photon individually. That's a photon interacting with material. So that actually becomes kind of a, a photon relay. And it's the relay handoff effect from one photon to the next that slows the process down. So photons out on their own are stuck traveling at sea all the time. For better or worse, uh, that's their speed. Now, there's a momentum formula that we can write in terms of gamma, as long as these other formulas are being written. And that's gamma squared minus 1 square root times mc squared. So uh, these become really handy formulas. Uh, these are formulas we're going to use a lot. And so we're going to practice using these with some examples. Uh, momentum can also be written as gamma mv. And so uh, that's useful in some situations also. Uh, this looks like the simpler formula, but because there's a factor of gamma and a factor of v, in order to solve for gamma or in order to solve for v, I usually end up switching it over into this version anyway. So I'm going to say this is actually the easier formula to work from, and this is kind of our backup formula uh, when that works out. Now, we've looked 
at, uh, so, you know, this is get, get familiar. These are your friends. Get familiar with these formulas. Um, we looked earlier at what happens to the gamma factor when we're going really slow. You know, most of our daily activities are at much, much lower speeds. And we said gamma can always be approximated at these low speeds with 1 plus 1 half v squared over 2. Well, let's plug that into our kinetic energy formula. If I take this low speed approximation of gamma and plug it in for gamma right there, what I get is 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared minus 1, and the 1 and the minus 1 cancel. And that tells me that the kinetic energy at low speeds is 1 half v squared over c squared times mc squared. Now, with factors of c canceled, becomes 1 half mv squared. Now, when I look at these formulas up here and go, huh, what? Gamma minus 1 mc squared? That, that doesn't look like 1 half mv squared at all, but it is. So, in the limit, as speeds are slow, 1 half mv squared, that's what the formula turns into. Okay. So we're also going to be using some of these formulas down here. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that the low speed formulas, um, we're, we're going to make use of that. Now, again, the conserved quantities here of energy are total energy is conserved and momentum, uh, relativistic momentum is conserved. All right, those are the new rules. Um, hope you guys think these are, you know, something that you want to start practicing. All right, let's do this. Let's practice with a, an electron. Let's have an electron with a speed of 4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. It says this electron is inside a cathode ray tube of a TV set. All right, how many of you remember TV sets that had cathode ray tubes inside them? Picture tubes is what they used to call these. Um, and that's been a while. Anyway, uh, it's a beam of electrons inside the, the old TV sets that would, would move at a high speed. And uh, so we're going to look at uh, an electron moving in a, a beam of electrons. And then here's an accelerator being used for uh, cancer therapy. So we're using uh, some kind of uh, radiation therapy, this time not photons, not x-rays, for the therapy, but using an electron, high moving electrons. Okay. Well, here are the numbers. So here's part A, 4 times 10 to the uh, 7 meters per second. Here's part B, uh, moving at 0.98 uh, times C. First thing I do is I calculate gamma. So the gamma for uh, the electrons in the TV set. 1.009, and the gamma factor for the uh, very fast-moving uh, cancer therapy electrons uh, have a gamma factor of 5.025. Now, I'm just going to use the formulas that we had on the previous page. Now, the formulas we had, I'm going to go and calculate total energy, I'm going to calculate kinetic energy, and I'm going to calculate momentum. I'm going to do it all, uh, and that's typically what I ask for on midterms, too, uh, is probably do a more, rather than just calculating one of these things, why not calculate them all? And then you can stare at them and think about what the numbers are telling you. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit more about mc squared. Uh, there's an mc squared in all these formulas. Do I need to put in the mass of an object and multiply by c squared? And if it's Fundamental particles, like an electron or a proton or a neutron that you're working with, there's an easier way. There's a real shortcut here, and let's take a look at the shortcut. So here are uh, maybe our, our best-known fundamental particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. And I've written down the masses of each of those uh, in kilograms. So, uh, and you can see the proton and neutron masses are really, really similar. And the uh, electron masses are, um, are much smaller. Now, that's m. Now, to get mc squared, I can multiply by mc squared. mc squared is going to give me a, 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 an energy quantity. 
and it's going to be in joules. Now, if I'm working with electrons and protons and neutrons, joules are not very useful energy units to work in terms of. What's much better to work in terms of for energy units are what are called EV. Now, um, back in Physics 4B, we introduced EV and we worked with EV quite a bit. Um, I'm hoping that, it, you know, wherever your Physics 4B class, if you were here uh, at Laney and, and part of, of my sequence of courses, we, we certainly spend a lot of time looking at EV. Uh, if, if you didn't, if you're not familiar with EV, it, it's just a different energy unit. They're very small. Uh, one EV corresponds to the energy of a, an object with charge, uh, one fun fundamental unit of charge moving through an electric potential of one volt. And so, uh, now when I do the conversion from joules into EV, what I find is that the electron, the mc squared value for an electron is 511,000 EV. And because it's a thousand, I wrote that as KeV. Now, over on the other side here, I don't know why I wrote those approximate signs. You can cross those out. Um, I, I guess it's because I put all the, yeah, I, I put all the, the sig figs in there. So uh, on that first one, um, it's saying approximately uh, 511,000 EV. Uh, and so the idea is that the last, you know, zeros there are probably rounded numbers. Um, if I do the same thing with the proton and the neutron, I find that the mc squared values for those are 938.3 and 939.6. And so, um, and those are in millions of EV. So, that's what the mc squared values are for the electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, if I'm reporting the energy or the kinetic energy or the momentum of these electrons, I'm going to be using EV. I'm not going to be using joules. And I'm going to be using these special relativity formulas, gamma times mc squared. So I can take that number, 1.009, multiply it by 511,000, and it tells me that the total energy of those electrons in that beam inside that TV set, 515,600 EV. Uh, if I'm only interested in the kinetic energy, not the total energy, then I'll use gamma minus 1. Now, the kinetic energy is only 4,600 EV. And as far as the kinetic energy goes, since these electrons each have one fundamental charge, I know that my TV set, the accelerator built into that TV set, is 4,600 volts. Okay, so I'm using a... Uh, electric potential of 4,600 volts to boost the electrons, okay? All right, the momentum that I have here, uh, I'm going to use the momentum formula, works out to be 68,750 EV. Now, that's a little harder to get a feel for what that amount of momentum represents, but in any case, that's the formula we're going to be working from, and, and we'll see more and more. So, as we get into more and more examples of how this gets used, uh, we will see how these numbers connect. Now, if the electron's going much faster, then it's going to have more total energy, it's going to have more kinetic energy. The mass is not affected, so the mass is still going to be 511,000, and uh, the momentum is going to be greater. So, on the part B of the problem, uh, those are the numbers that I came up with. So, for these individual electrons, uh, they now, at a speed of, of 98C, a good portion of the energy now is uh, due to its kinetic energy. So, uh, lots of... Um, Lots of the total energy is given by the, um, the kinetic energy of those electrons. Okay. So the gamma factor here is 5, and uh, that's actually telling us that uh, the kinetic energy is going to be about four times larger than the mass energy. All right. Uh, so that's good to practice to those examples. Uh, earlier, 
We had talked about uh, spacecraft and bringing them up to really, really, really high speeds. And uh, how much energy would it take to, you know, get a modest sized spacecraft up to a really high speed and then send it off to some really distant destination. So I looked up the mass of the space shuttle. A uh, space shuttle comes in at about 100,000 kilograms. Now, the space shuttle is not configured for traveling to other star systems. So I thought, well, what if you could create a, a, a spacecraft that's 100,000 kilograms, kind of the size of the space shuttle, that could travel to distant star systems. Um, and we took all of the global energy, all of the energy used on the planet Earth for an entire year. So I looked that up and I found these estimates that if you take all of the energy generated in all the power plants and all the automobile, you know, all of the uh, fuels that are used in generating energy for the year, the total output's about 8 times 10 to the 21 joules. So let's say we take all of the energy, we get the whole planet on board, we go, okay, we would like to send these astronauts to some distant planet, is everybody okay if we don't use any energy for the year and just invest that all in this one spacecraft? And you know, everybody says, sure, we'll do that, we'll go with that energy for the year. So we take the 8 times 10 to the 21 joules and we use that to give this spacecraft kinetic energy. Now, the MC squared for the spacecraft worked out to be 9 times 10 to the 21 kilograms. Now, here I actually did just use 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. This is not a fundamental particle. It's not an electron or proton or a neutron. So I did plug in, uh, you know, kind of standard values for C. And uh, the gamma factor that I ended up with when I did this is 1.9, so roughly a gamma factor of 2. Now, when I put the 1.9 in to see how fast we could get this, this uh, spacecraft going, look at that, 0.85c. It's only one spacecraft, and we're using all of the energy from planet Earth for the entire year. We've saved it all up and invested it in this one spacecraft and we could only get it up to 85% of the speed of light. Okay, so let's say the planet is four years away. Uh, the time it's going to take there is going to be 4.7 years. That's pretty good. And then 4.7 years back. Uh, with a gamma factor of two, the astronauts on side would only experience, you know, 2.3 years, 2.35 years go by, only half as much time passes. But um, what do you think? That's a lot of energy. So you can see uh, our best understanding of this tells us that we would need new energy sources that are just enormous energy sources in order to zip around the galaxy uh, in a, a spacecraft um, uh, a, a, a comfortably sized spacecraft. So it could happen, right? We could find something new. Uh, matter antimatter reactors, right, in order to do this. All right, let's uh, try another example here. Um, this is another example working with energy and mass and whatever. Uh, we've picked another fundamental particle, something called a pion. Uh, this is a symbol for the pion, it has a mass. They gave us a mass in terms of kilograms, which I'm not sure about. I'm going to switch it over to mc squared. And then they gave us a speed, and so they're going to ask, what is its kinetic energy, and what would be the calculated kinetic energy if we were to use what we learned in physics 4a? And if we use what we learned in physics 4a and applied it to something moving at 80% the speed of light, it's going to be wrong. It's going to be really, really wrong, so let's take a look and see how those numbers differ. So, uh, here is this fundamental particle, this uh, pion, and uh, it's got the mass, it's got the velocity, and I, first of all, switched 
uh, the kilogram mass into mc squared. I counted how many joules, and then I put that into EV. So practice these conversions into EV. You do want to become familiar with using these different energy units. Now, the speed uh, is 0 0.80 C. I checked that out too. And then I went back to Physics 4A because I said, oh, I forgot to read the chapter on relativity. It's the midterm. I'm just going to do 1 half mv squared. It's going to be fine. Uh, and so 1 half mv squared. Uh, now, I actually did this too. What I did was I took our old familiar formula of 1 half mv squared and I rewrote it. I rewrote it by adding a couple factors of C here and here. And I'm going to argue that that was to make the problem easier. Because since I know the mc squared for the pion, it's 135 MeV that I put in there, the big M standing for millions, for mega, uh, 1 half m v squared uh, gives me 43.2 MeV. And so uh, the answer comes out in the units that I want. Um, and that's, that's probably how you want to practice doing these kind of problems. So I used a classical formula and got 43.2 MeV. Now, it's going to be wrong. Uh, it's going to be way underestimating how much kinetic energy. So uh, relativity says, no, no, no. Uh, kinetic energy, you're going to have to go and calculate this as gamma minus 1 mc squared. Now, I calculated gamma for the speed they gave us. And that gamma value came in at 1.67. So I put that into my formula, and I ended up with 90 MeV. So what's going on here? And what's happening is that classical physics predicts that if I put more and more kinetic energy in, I can get to whatever speed I want. Uh, there's just this one-half mv squared formula that tells me uh, how much kinetic energy I will need. But in reality, as you get closer and closer to the speed of light, you get less return on your kinetic energy. Uh, you're putting the kinetic energy in, but the velocity is not going up as fast as you would have expected from classical physics. So you're, you're bumping up against reality. And so uh, the kinetic energy here uh, to reach a speed is going to be more than what you would have estimated from classical physics. And this is how nature really works. Uh, that's the correct number, the one from uh, special relativity. Um, all right. Uh, questions on that? This is, uh, I know it's a new set of uh, formulas. And so you know, keep coming back to, I guess, oh, we're quite a ways into this, aren't we? Uh, these formulas, you know, this is kind of the new formula sheet that you want to work from uh, when you're doing these problems. All right, let's see. We've got time for one more example here. Let's do it. Uh, here is a... Uh, here is a uh, energy mass uh, example. Um, from nuclear decay, and it's telling us that uh, the energy required or released in a nuclear reaction, uh, uh, when that occurs, there is a change in mass between before and after. Uh, let's look at a particular radioactive decay. We're going to be looking at uh, decay of a nucleus of uranium-232. That's a particular isotope. And we're going to, it alpha decays into a thorium-228 nucleus uh, plus uh, an, a helium atom is what they're calling it here. So they've, they've given us, yeah, so they've given us the masses in what are called atomic mass units. So uh, an atomic mass unit, let's see what that uh, consists of. So... Uh, this is going to be a chance to take a look at using the formula E equals mc squared. So uh, here's how it works. If, if I take a look at the uranium-232, 
There's my uranium. It's got 92 protons. It's got 232 total protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And then it decays into thorium and helium. Now, these masses that we have listed, those are the masses of a neutral atom. It includes the nucleus and it includes all the electrons. Now, in a nuclear reaction, when a nucleus undergoes radioactive decay, uh, the electrons are, are spectators. They're not really involved in the decay at all. And the particles coming out in the decay are moving fast enough that some of the electrons could get left behind. But in any case, our best approach to this in terms of uh, calculating how much energy is released is to go ahead and use these masses that are given for these particular isotopes. Now, uh, once we're into nuclear physics, and we've got a couple chapters on nuclear physics coming up, uh, once we're into the nuclear physics chapters, we'll find out that in Appendix F in our book are lists of these different isotopes and their particular masses. These masses are not coming off the periodic table. Uh, the periodic table masses average over all the isotopes of a particular element. When we're looking at a particular isotope and how it behaves, we need to know the mass of that particular isotope. Okay, so that's where all of this is coming from. And uh, what we can do then is we can take the mass of the uranium that we started with, subtract off the mass of the thorium and the mass of the helium, and see what's left, and look, the masses didn't add up. And that's because mass isn't conserved. Uh, and nuclear reactions are a good way to see this. Masses aren't conserved in reactions. If a reaction gives off heat, that heat is coming from a reduction in mass. Now, in chemistry classes, we, in, in chemistry in general, we use a principle called conservation of mass in reactions. And we always use the assumption that the mass before matches the mass after the reaction has taken place. Um, that's not strictly true. It turns out that in chemical reactions, the amount of energy that's released, or the amount of energy that goes in, whether it's exothermic or endothermic, is so small compared with the mass of the samples, we can ignore it. So it's not that mass is strictly conserved, it's that, you know, within the abilities of our best scales to measure the masses of the products and the reactants, in a chemical reaction, they're, they're essentially the same. But nuclear reactions are about a million times more energetic than a chemical reaction. In nuclear reactions, the energy that's released uh, can be uh, measured and related to the difference in mass of the materials before and after. So, what we're finding here is that there is this uh, missing mass. We've got a certain amount of mass that we can't account for uh, in the reaction. And that mass has been converted into kinetic energy. It's kind of what we were talking about when we were looking at those uh, formulas earlier. Uh, the mass now has been converted to kinetic energy. Now, there's a conversion factor that we can use um, if we have one atomic mass unit of mass that's converted into kinetic energy. We can demonstrate that one atomic mass unit is equivalent to 931.5 MeV of energy. So those two quantities go together. If I have a missing mass, of 0 0.00581 atomic mass unit. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when I multiply this, uh, that's 5.41 million EV. 
Uh, and that's a good amount of energy that's released in this radioactive decay process. So radioactive decay, typically most radioactive decay reactions release uh, millions of EV of energy. Compare that to a chemical reaction. If I break a chemical bond in a molecule, and that's what we're doing when we run a chemical reaction, if I run a chemical reaction and break a few chemical bonds and reconnect some different chemical bonds, a typical chemical bond might be 5 EV. Uh, maybe a very energetic bond might be 10 EV. But compare a chemical reaction of 5 or 10 EV worth of energy to this radioactive decay, which is 5 million EV. So that's the same amount of energy that would occur if I had 5, uh, 5 million molecules undergoing some chemical reaction. In this case, it's just one nucleus that decays. All right, so the picture we have here then is uh, uranium uh, decaying, turning into thorium and helium. If I treat the uranium as being at rest initially, then I'm expecting that the thorium and the helium will head out in opposite directions. Now, if you've looked at these types of decays where a little piece of helium comes out, you know that these are referred to as alpha decay. So this is the alpha process within radioactive uh, decay. And uh, the 5.41, you know, that's a kind of a typical amount of energy released in these reactions. Okay, any questions on that that uh, are coming up here? Now, just for comparison down below, I said, what happens if instead of just one atomic mass unit? Now, one atomic mass unit is about the same mass as a proton or a neutron, whereas one gram is an entire mole of protons and neutrons. So uh, one you know, proton mass by itself is about 931 MeV. Uh, one gram of material has the uh, equivalent energy of 9 times 10 to the 13 joules. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead. That's probably a good place to uh, stop for the day. So I'm going I'm to stop there. We'll come back. We'll look at some more examples with uh, mass and momentum and energy. Uh, and then we'll move on and look at more of the uh, mathematical foundations of special relativity.